Right, thank you, Susan. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Alexis Haslam, who is a professional archaeologist who tells me he's been uh, involved in pre-development archaeology in the London area for, for many years, and but has now landed his dream job working full time at Fulham Palace, uh, where he's doing uh, uh, some wonderful research that he'll doubtless tell us about and, and writing uh, up a paper on the subject. So without more ado, I'm delighted to hand over to you, Alexis, for the subject of this evening, the restoration of Fulham Palace. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen now, see if this works. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. yes. We good? Brilliant. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, my lecture today is um, on the restoration of Fulham Palace, uh, a project that I get involved with really uh, back in 2017. So I've been there for nearly five years now. So, um, if you know Fulham Palace, um, or even if you don't know it, um, it's uh, a scheduled ancient monument and it is a former uh, moated site um, located on the north bank of the River Thames there, just across from Putney. And therefore, because of its scheduled monument status, before we undertake any archaeological investigations on the site, uh, we need consent from Historic England, uh, specifically the inspector of scheduled ancient monuments. So before we can dig a hole, uh, we need her consent, Jane Tadell. Um, within the walled garden, if you know it, uh, the gardeners are allowed 300 mil before an archeologist has to be present. Um, outside the walled garden, it's a mere uh, 10 centimeters. So you can see why it's probably quite handy to have an archeologist about. So this essentially is what the site looked like in the 19th century, it's the 1831 estate map. And you can see, the moat there running all the way around it. So essentially you've got, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but you can see this is Bishop's Avenue. So you've got one, um, one length of the moat down there. This section ran along sort of um, Fulham Palace Road, Fulham High Street, originally extending right out to, down towards Putney Bridge, down about here, or old Putney Bridge, old Fulham Bridge as it was. This got culverted in the 18th century, but there are these rather interesting bits here, which aren't natural, you can see the very, very, very straight wing, a very tight right angle there. And so I've been doing quite a bit of research into, into those legs of it. But essentially you have to imagine, originally the site was almost like a little island um, with uh, a kind of uh, channel running down Bishop's Avenue, one down Fulham uh, Palace Road and Fulham High Street, creating kind of an ayat or an island on the Thames. So essentially it's kind of an island on the River Thames, just like you get Chiswick or Brentford or places like that. So things have changed a little bit since I wrote this. Um, the age of the moat um, is unknown, um, although Iron Age or Danish origins have been suggested. I think I've managed to, to quash those uh, kind of theories, to be quite honest. Um, but the archaeology on the site goes back an awful long way. So we have that kind of Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age and Iron Age activity on site is a very, very busy in the late Mesolithic to early Neolithic. You get an awful lot of struck flint on the site dating to that period. We've also got evidence for fourth century occupation on the site. We've got ditches, we've got some structural evidence, so a very late Roman settlement as well. And the manner of the bishops of London established on the site during the Saxon to medieval period. So it becomes part of uh, the land of the Bishop of London as we were in 704. And the moat uh, is first documented 1163 to 80, and it's called the Magna Fossa or the Great Ditch in 1392. So those are kind of the first historical references we have towards it. So big alterations undertaken on the site itself during the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, and the palace itself was at its maximum size in the 17th century. So the very late 1600s, early 1700s. If you, uh, if you know the site, the wall garden as it is now, um, that was established during the tenure of Bishop Terrick. So he was Bishop of London between 1764 and 1777. So the palace itself was almost like a bit of a summer house for the bishops. But one, of the, uh, one of the few manors that survived right through with the large Bishop of London not actually leaving until 1973. So the question really is why is this site so important and what makes it so special and what, what makes it such an attractive place for 
for uh, people to come and visit and live on for thousands and thousands of years. Um, when we look here, we can see the geology map and the site itself is on those Kempton Park River Terrace gravels um, just over here. Uh, and those are very free draining, uh, very nice soils. Uh, the land rising from the Thames up towards Fulham Palace Road. Um, and one of the most important things really is the concept that the site was uh, right next to a ford. So uh, if you have to imagine back in time, the uh, Thames was much wider and much shallower. shallower. And essentially um, you could cross from, um, from Fulham to Putney and vice versa, just about where the current um, Putney Bridge is. Um, but essentially it was a affordable point, which makes it a, a very, very significant and important point in the landscape. So the site of Fulham Palace has been part of the Bishop's Estate um, since 704 and remained uh, as a manor house of the Bishops of London um, as an official residence up until 1973 when the, the last uh, bishop left, um, and then fell into the sort of hands of the council um, and the uh, Fulham Palace Trust taking it over in 2011. So uh, Bishop's residence uh, is recorded on the site as early as 1104. Um, Again, I've changed sort of my ideas about this. Some people uh, refer to, they think that the first, um, the first sort of manor itself was in the northwest corner of the site. I actually think it's um, uh, further towards the north of the palace now. But during the 13th century, the palace was rebuilt in its current position. So if you, if you visit the palace today, uh, the location of the palace itself has pretty much been there in one form or another since the early 1200s. So starting in 2017, which is really where my job started at Fulham Palace, um, was a major restoration project. So this was a 3.8 million pound uh, restoration project entitled Discovering the Bishop of London Palace of Fulham. Um, not quite the catchiest title, but, um, but a really important project nonetheless. And um, there was a 1.8 million pound grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. The rest of it was, uh, was crowdfunded. And the main thing that um, was necessary to, to be undertaken was really to restore our Tudor quadrangle. So this is the quadrangle here, uh, for, for those that know Fulham Palace, um, constructed between 1493 and 1495. And we really wanted to bring back uh, our key room, such as our Great Hall, which you can see at the back there on the left-hand side with the big windows, um, replace historic varieties of plants because the site is, of course, the second oldest botanic garden in London was very famous uh, when Bishop Compton was here in the late 1600s for growing new species from the new world. Um, uh, improve access to the site and obviously uh, with it being a scheduled nature monument, archaeology formed a very important part of this. So my job at the moment is to look at all of the archaeology on the site which really began in an excavation in 1972 and to piece it all together and really tell the story of the site. But as you can see from this plan here, the number of digs that have taken place, and those sort of red lines all over the place, uh, just show you the extent of kind of the work that I have to do to, to make head or tail of it all. Um, it's certainly been very busy over the years. Um, but the first thing that I had to do um, as part of the restoration project was not only we were restoring the um, the, the rooms of the palace, creating a new museum and, and making uh, the palace itself, uh, restoring it to what it once originally would have looked like. But essentially, um, the excavation I was asked to undertake was to locate a dovecot. So you can see this plan here. This is what the, the, the palace looked like in 1764. Uh, we have our Tudor forecourt or a Tudor quadrangle just sort of here. Uh, the funny shaped sort of trippy. trippy Zoidal thing. And then this is kind of our medieval core here. Um, sadly, this was knocked down in the renovations of the 1760s. Our lovely old chapel went. Um, but down here, um, at the bottom left, you can see a kind of octagonal shaped structure there, which was a dovecot. So one of the ideas was that we could dig a trench, we could try and find, uh, locate, and excavate this dovecot. So before we started digging, we undertook a geophysical survey in 2013, looking for this dovecot. Um, 
And we got scheduled monument consent from Historic England to dig two trenches to look for the dovecot and something interesting here. So the things you can really see cropping up on this geophysical survey here are a very interesting large blob that you can see here, it looks slightly linear, but also this sort of straight red line over there. So we're interested in trying to find that dovecot and then trying to perhaps find out what this red line might have been. So the excavation really, this op uh, provided an opportunity for um, for volunteers to get involved with it. So we have a huge uh, volunteering program at Fulham Palace, um, the largest in the borough, uh, to get school groups in, um, to hand dig on the site of Ed and a, a scheduled ancient monument, as well as uniform groups like brownies and guides and scouts and cubs. Um, and as well as that, I run a young archeologist club as well, so to get them involved in the excavation too, um, to be undertaken, obviously under professional supervision so a real opportunity to get involved with an excavation so these are the two trenches that i came up with that i thought would be good to to dig um, the larger one at the bottom there to try and find that dovecot and the, and the sort of uh, thinner uh, rectangular one um, at the top uh, looking for that rather strange red line that popped so um, this was the excavation under underway here and this was the large trench at the bottom looking for the dovecot but what's kind of interesting about this is you can see this kind of in, uh, intriguing kind of white sort of uh, mortuary layer starting to turn up there. So as I was saying, lots of community engagement every day. Um, we did um, ask the archaeologists for the general public to come along and ask us uh, questions. Uh, we had uh, my volunteers there in the top right hand corner, some experienced ex archaeologists who wanted to get involved in it, but also people who had never done anything like this before, were just fascinated by the idea of it and wanted to have a crack at it. And what left there, the Brownie group who came along and they raised some money for us as well, which was amazing. And then in the bottom right, that's my young archeologist club there. So obviously they were, they were very heavily involved with the excavation um, as it went on. So this is what the trench looked like, the large trench uh, looking for the dovecot. Um, you can see it in the back section there, very, that, that, that kind of mortuary layer again, looking like a bit of a sandwich. But probably what's most important here is down the front, you see these two spots excavated here. Essentially, this was a, a, a large ditch running um, along the side of the trench just there. So those two slots across the ditch, uh, very, very narrow, only one metre wide, and we didn't get the whole ditch. You can see we just got one side of it there, uh, but it produced uh, considerable amounts of, uh, of material, which was really fascinating. So from the material that we recovered, which included this rather lovely Frecken stoneware jug that you can see in my hand just there, uh, we know that the ditch was backfilled between 1480 and 1550. And this is really interesting because the timbers in our great hall, just behind the jug there, we know were felled in 1493. We've undertaken uh, dendrochronology in the roof timbers. So we know the palace was uh, built during the reign of Henry VII, so a very early Tudor building. And the ditch appears to have originally been medieval, but was backfilled in the period between 1480 and 1550, not long after, at, or, or perhaps contemporary with the construction of our Tudor courtyard. So we've got some very nice pottery out of it. We've got local redwares, we've got that German stoneware again, uh, lots of drinking vessels, Cistercian ware as well in the form of cups and jugs. So this is all fitting into what you'd expect really of a Renaissance high status house for the period. So again, Bishop of London, very important, um, uh, third sort of highest after the Archbishop of Canterbury in York. It's the Bishop of London, so a very, very important high status household that he's running here. And this is material that's been backfilled in the ditch from his household. But perhaps what was most interesting, um, believe it or not, was the sheer quantity of animal bone that we got out of it so absolutely loads and loads of animal bone and you can see in the pictures on the left hand side there lots of butchery marks um, where the kind of bones have been chopped up and this tells us a great deal about really what was being consumed at the palace at the time and this probably derived from the kitchen so we're getting a great insight here into the kind of Tudor diet of the, of the uh, Bishop of London so again butchery marks and we got the usual kind of animals that you'd expect uh, cattle sheep or goat and pig but we've got some rather other interesting critters as well so as you can see there non 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 indeed but we've got things like baby rabbits um baby doves again um suckling pig um deer 
So again, quite expensive meat as it would have been at the time. Uh, really quite some quite strange things as well. Um, song thrushes, uh, duck as well as um, pheasants, baby chicks, which perhaps uh, suggested maybe that fork cream was uh, taking place on site as well. We certainly got um, evidence of kestrel bones and some red kite too. Um, but one of the most interesting things as well was the, the number of fish bones that we got out. And what was interesting about this was it was actually the keen eyes of the kind of the young archaeologists who were picking these fish bones out. So I wasn't doing a lot of sieving, but they were um, able to pick, pick out lots and lots of these tiny fish bones. And uh, quite often bones like that get lost in an archaeological excavation. Um, you know, when you're under time pressure, sort of sifting through um, the spoil to look for the fish bones isn't something that comes higher the priority. But this, again, gave us great insight into diet. So we've got things like the top left, we've got salmon, we've got place and flounder, we've got ling, we've got thornback ray, and we've got cod as well. So uh, local fish, uh, as well as stuff that's coming from further out too. Uh, and perhaps one of the, the most interesting things we got as well was um, turkey bone which is um, really interesting if you think that the ditch was backfilled between 1480 and 1550. Actually, the first historical reference to turkeys in Europe dates to 1520, the birds obviously coming from North America. Uh, and they're supposed to have been introduced to England by William Strickland uh, in either 1524 or 1526 when he brought them back to Bristol. Uh, sort of contemporary bones in Exeter, 1520 to 1550, and St Albans again, 1534 to 1550. Uh, our date, 1480 to 1550, fits quite comfortably with that. Again, interestingly, they're uh, all on ecclesiastical sites. But these are certainly, um, at the moment, the earliest dated turkey bones within London. It may well have been that the turkeys were brought in as showbirds rather than um, for eating because they fan, rather like a peacock. Um, but yeah, certainly so far, the earliest in London, and we quite like having a lot of fun at this uh, Christmas, saying, you know, who's got the oldest turkey and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, very important find. So we were wondering really where, where is this, these huge quantities of animal bone clearly butchered and, and what's being served at the, at the bishop's table, where is it coming from? So this map you can see here is an interpretation of a parliamentary of 1640, a survey of 1647. So when, uh, during the Civil War, when the bishops of London, or the bishops were done away with uh, the, the sites, uh, ecclesiastical, episcopal land, was sold and quick surveys were undertaken and Fulham Palace was no different to the Bishop of London was, uh, was turfed out. Uh, a survey was undertaken and it does record a kitchen garden on the southwestern side of the palace, uh, just over here. See my arrow just there. Uh, kitchens down here, but there's also supposed to be a slaughterhouse somewhere just down here. Um, on the moat. So if you think our ditch is just in front of the palace, just there, slaughterhouse over, it's not really that far away uh, from the kitchens and the slaughterhouse. So that's probably where our animal bone is deriving from. We got some absolutely lovely small finds out of the ditch as well. So dress accessories like lace chains, pins, a purse ring, which is essentially sort of metal, um, metal ring sort of thing that you put inside your purse to stop cut purses slashing it. But you can see in that uh, picture above left, we've got a die. Uh, this is actually called a teetotum. It's made from antler. Um, and at the moment, we can't actually find any contemporary parallels to it. But interestingly, fulhams was an historic term used to describe false or loaded dice between the 16th and 18th centuries. Certainly mentioned uh, by Shakespeare in the Merry Wives of Windsor. And the area was known, or Fulham, rather differently to how it is now at the time, was a noted resort of sharpers. So uh, not the most um, well to do, as it were. But we also got a nice coin of Elizabeth I there, which suggests perhaps the final infilling of our a ditch as it gets levelled off completely, uh, taking place between 1630 and 80, and then uh, another final deposit between 1722. So then uh, a nice coin for the bottom left there, Elizabeth I, uh, date to 1569. Lovely, lovely coin coming out of that ditch. So the question really, what is this ditch? used for? Why is it here in front of the palace uh, in the medieval period? Uh, obviously no longer seen as necessary and backfilled between 1480 and 1550. But it's still sort of, you can still see things sort of connecting to the moat even here on the Ordnance Survey maps of the late 19th century. So we know um, between 1461 and 1483, 
that there was a great, the great hall was situated behind what's called a key. So it may well be that, uh, that it could have been associated with a key or something like that. Um, and, you know, again, as I was saying that these sort of features, although they're in, filled in, they're still sort of bits sticking around in the late 19th century. So once that ditch is filled in, the area that we're excavating essentially between 1680 and 1750 is open ground and it seems to have been used for dumping material. So we've got some nice um, clay pipes out of there. This one's uh, dated between 1460 and 1460 and has a nice Agnes Day stamp on the bottom, the lamb flag just there. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, that kind of um, uh, mortuary layer became really, really interesting. And we think that's laid down with dumps between 1750 and 1750. So that dump layer produced some rather interesting plasterwork. So as you can see here, we've got some rather nice uh, grotesque faces um, appearing. So they look a little bit like the green man. So these are dumped in the area between 1750-1650. And we cleaned all those up. Again, volunteers involved in the fines processing, they're all trained in it, how to box the material up, how to mark it, how to tag it. So this was all um, cleaned up, cleaned up the plaster, and it was sent off for specialist analysis. There you can see all the lovely plaster work that came out of that horizon, that dump layer, uh, dating to between 1750 and 16. Um, and the, the plaster expert, she looked at it and she said that there were three schemes present. Uh, looks like bits of ceiling and overmantel, uh, molded and sculpted elements, uh, probably dating to the early and some bits maybe late 17th century. 17th century plaster work has obviously been ripped out of the palace and dumped in the paddock area between 1750 and 60. And interestingly, this ties in with Bishop Sherlock's renovations in both the Great Hall. Uh, at this time, and also when he built his grand dining room between 1750 and 60. So it looks like Sherlock's made changes to the palace. He's ripped the ceiling down and he's dumped it out in the paddock area. So when we look at um, the kind of the schemes that we've got here, and they've all got funny names, these things, um, but essentially they're, they're made out of uh, lime and sand with some hair uh, present with cornice elements. And they've got these names like Cavetto and OG and things like that. Um, leaf and dart and acanthus leaves are all really 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 nice um, high status pieces of plaster and also uh, things like these gourds these grapes leaves and tendrils and terminals and so these appear to derive from a high foliate a high relief of fruit and foliate garland so this would have been on the ceiling and it would have been very very fancy indeed as well as these grotesques that you can see, those faces I mentioned, and this cartouche, which funny enough was actually found by a brownie. So we were doing well with our community archaeology there. Um, and the cartouche might have come from something like an overmantle, but it's, it's very, very high status uh, plasterwork. So when we were sort of researching how old it might be, the, the most comparable ceiling that we can find is actually Ham House. Um, so, uh, which, which is still there, this ceiling. So William Murray uh, got Ham House in 1638 and he renovated it in the style of Inigo Jones. So the plasterwork here at Ham House was undertaken by an individual named Joseph Kinsman. It certainly wasn't cheap, costing seven shillings and six pence a yard. And as you can see, when you look at this, this fruit and foliage garland, it looks really similar to the kind of things that we, have find, we found uh, dumped out in our paddock area with those kind of grapes and gourds and melons and tendrils and um, uh, kind of terminals as well. So the question really for us was how old is our plaster? So we know that it's dumped between 1750 during trade renovations. Again, it looks like that Inigo Jones style. He was surveyor to the Royal Works in 1615, probably not dating to the Commonwealth period. Um, the restoration again, a period of austerity. Um, we know that Bishop Compton was far more interested in spending his money on plants than on buildings because in 1714, his successor, Bishop Robinson, actually had to pull the state wing of the palace down because it was such a poor condition. Uh, and of course, by that time, the scheme that we're looking at here was well out of date. So the question we were asking is who commissioned this work? And we think it was. Bishop Juxon, who was Bishop of London between 1633 and 1649, later to become the Archbishop of Canterbury after the Restoration. And the reasons for this, um, we've, his coat of arms was found 
in the grounds or technically in a load of rubbish around the back of the house, according to a 19th century document. Um, but whenever a bishop uh, undertakes any form of building work at the, uh, at, the, at the palace at Fulham, generally they put their coat of arms up. So we always get the two cross swords, uh, which represent the Bishop of London, as well as their own personal coat of arms sort of on the right hand side. So the mitre and the cartouche look somewhat similar. It's around about the right time. And obviously in 1636, uh, Bishop Compton must have, sorry, Bishop Juxon must have done some quite serious renovation works because he had this, um, this lovely coat of arms made up. So all these wonderful things I've been talking about, lovely finds, uh, but you'll notice I haven't mentioned the dovecot. So um, what do we know about this dovecot? Well, in 1764, before the uh, large scale renovations of the palace under Bishop Terrick, a dilapidation survey was undertaken and the dove house, as it was, was recorded in a poor state, uh, needed repair and point to the external brickwork, the tiles, the turrets, the twining posts, which would have been um, inside the, um, the tough house itself, repairs to the door, uh, new hinges, etc., etc. So the problem we've got here, obviously, is if our plaster is done between 1750 and 1760, and the dovecot was still standing in 1764, then we certainly were in the wrong place to find the dovecot if it was still there. So unfortunately, we didn't find the dovecot, but I'd like to think we found some other very, very important aspects of the palace. Um, and quoting that geophysical survey of 2013, there is no clear recognition of the footprint of the dark god. So I actually think it's probably further, further to the sort of northwest, towards what's now a nursery area. And we probably didn't miss it by too much, but it wasn't wasn't where we were digging. Uh, we can see it here on the Rogue's map of 17 to 5. Um, you can see the kind of the dark god just there, that kind of dot in the paddock. Um, in the outer court, the fair brick tough house standing in the southwest corner there of a house where in dwelleth Robert Lee, the housekeeper of the Fawcett Mansion. So I think we were just off there a little bit. Um, but never mind. Found some great stuff instead. So um, we also found this dog, which is now in our museum, uh, very popular, interestingly, with, um, with school groups. And it's not very old, it's 19th century, but um, it's a big dog. And uh, the skeleton is male. Um, it's massive sized, massive size, and arthritic. And we think it's probably Bishop Tate's dog who had a mastiff called the Grand Old Captain. So I kind of, I'm pretty certain this is Captain and he now resides in our museum for everyone to have a look at as they want to see. But getting back beyond the archeology span to the restoration of the palace itself was one of the main aspects of it was to restore our brickwork, which had really, really suffered over the years from um, poor repointing, things like black ash mortar were used in the Victorian period, concrete and cement used in the 20th century. None of these are conducive to, um, to what a Tudor, you know, an early Tudor structure dating to the period of Henry VII should look like. So we had to do a lot of repair work on our brickwork and repointing. Now, uh, getting Tudor bricks isn't that easy. And we had to go to a company called HG Matthews who uh, now make, Tudor bricks using traditional wood fired methods. And this was a, a trip that we made by our conservation in action team um, up to HG Matthews to see them making our bricks. And here you can see their wood fired brick kiln. Interestingly, to begin with, they didn't know how to wood fire bricks. It's rather a lost art in um, Britain. And they had to get uh, people over from New York State to show them how to do it. Uh, but they are now um, well on it, as it were. And these are our bricks being fired in the kiln. And this is our restoration work to take place. So all, um, all that horrible um, repointing that had been done in, in uh, black ash and concrete and cement was being raked out, um, getting rid of all that mortar, uh, getting rid of the damaged bricks, um, unsympathetic repair works using bricks, which were not, again, conducive to a Tudor building. And then uh, re, uh, repointing it using hotline mortar, which was mixed up on site. We had our uh, uh, consultant um, called um, Gerard Lynch, who's kind of the foremost expert in, uh, in Tudor brickwork. So all the hotline mortar was mixed up on site. We used a, um, a bond or a, a, a pointing called the double struck, 
which you can see in the bottom right hand picture there, which almost looks like a kind of notched V. This is traditionally what Tudor buildings would have been pointed in. We are the sort of the first people to do it. It's been found at Hampton Court, also at the Archbishop of York's Palace of Battersea. Uh, quite often, the traditional thing to do with a Tudor building is to use something called a heritage joint, where you kind of use hot uh, lime mortar and then beat it so it looks weathered. But when the building was first built, this was what it would have been looked like. So our whole building has been repointed using this double strap on in traditional hot lime mortar. So you can see what the uh, outside of the palace looked like before. Uh, with a sort of bad pointing and nasty brickwork. This is halfway through it, um, just on the outside there. And this is what it looks like now. So it's really, really, you can really see it's really brought it back to life um, and how it would have looked when it was first built. Um, other things we did, we put a new driveway in as well, rather nice new resin-bonded um, drive. And this is what the Tudor courtyard inside it looked like. We've got that kind of... Uh, what we call diapering, which is the kind of diamond shaped cat pattern. You can see they were somewhat lost in the um, in the black ash mortar and the, and the nasty sort of cement and bringing it back really with a nice new um, pointing. So you can really see what it originally looked like when it was first built again. So lots and lots of work going into this. Um, all of the, um, the gauged brickwork, as it's called, Called. These aren't moulded bricks, they have to be cut and carved. That was all taking place on site again, so people could come and ask questions, they could come and see it taking place. We had a sponsor a brick campaign where you could sponsor a brick and write your name on the back of it, and then that would get put into the brickwork too. Um, and up on the top as well, the trefoils up on their tower in the courtyard weren't in great condition, so they are to be hand carved and cut on site as well. And you can see them going back on there. Um, making it much, uh, bringing it back to life. As well as this uh, raking out by our lower window in the tower, it's really interesting to see some, um, some pottery there. So the window, the lower window in our tower is original. And when we looked at the pottery, um, it's Martin Camp stoneware, dating between 1486 and 1600s. And then again, that again fits in with our kind of uh, our date, our date of 1995. And this material, you know, builders have obviously used the packing between the brickwork and the um, and the lower window there. Uh, that actually comes from um, northern France. There, most of this material, this this mine capstone was exported. It would originally have a, had a, a wicker casing, a bit like a Chianti bottle, uh, and used for holding liquids such as water and wine. So maybe the builders were having a bit of a drink while they were get cracking on with their work. And also on top of the tower is this rather lovely bell. Um, which we didn't know a massive amount about, but when we looked at it, uh, you can see that in the picture on the right-hand side, it's got three bells. So that was um, forged at the Whitechapel foundry. And it's got the date 1676 on it and was uh, cast under the name of Bishop Henry Compton as well. So uh, he's obviously had this rather nice bell cast, probably originally above the old medieval chapel, which was knocked down in the six, uh, 1760s, now hangs above our, um, tower in the courtyard and rings every day. And the other interesting thing that we found um, above our large Tudor arch, which is the main entrance to the palace, was when we raked out there, was we found these rather wonderful um, oyster shells wedged between um, the cross joints on the bricks. And so I asked Gerard a bit about this, why would that happen? And he said, essentially, when they were building the arch, because the lime water is so sloth, soft um, setting, it takes a long time to set, and it can slump. So by lock, by putting those oyster shells in there, essentially locking the brickwork to prevent the arch from collapsing whilst the mortar was setting. So um, really interesting piece of, uh, of kind of like um, on the spur of the moment, I suppose, uh, brickwork there by our Tudor masons. But um, obviously oysters were, were fairly standard food back then, and the shells had obviously become fairly fairly handy for um, for the the brick masons. Um, also, all kinds of things just packed in here and there. It seems to be a, a kind of general theme. We also got walnuts wedged in the walls where we saw them, and almond shells, um, wine bottles as well. These are a little bit later repair works in the sort of nineteenth century. Um, so all kinds of things being shoved into the building. Um, this was rather interesting as well. Um, if you come to the palace and go through the main doors at the bottom of the tower, you'll see these two faces. They weren't in great condition. Um, at the time and needed some reworking. Um, but you can see on the right hand side the coat of arms there again. So the two cross swords 
and then this is Bishop Hooley's coat of arms. So this, this portrait was actually put in by Bishop Hooley in the early 19th century. But when we undertook the restoration, they were, they were recast and replaced back on. And as all those sort of layers of paint came off, we got a clearer idea of the faces. What became quite interesting was the fact it, it became quite apparent that um, Bishop Hooley had in fact put himself and his wife on the front of the palace as these two heads. So the heralds are in fact uh, Bishop Hooley. You can see there a bust of him on the right hand side there looking very, very similar to our, the one on our, um, the one on the front of our uh, porch and his wife Mary Frances Hooley there as well again looking very very similar so it looks like the Hooleys put their uh, their own faces onto the front of the palace and they are still wel welcoming guests today which is one of the nice parts of it. and there's the coat of arms being fully restored there we repainted and it's looking much much better than it did. We also put in new paths uh, around the wall garden um, in the in the process turning up um, an older path um, and the general things coming out there as well. So expanding right through into the 20th century here, uh, not a very deep excavation, uh, but we got a few things We sort of uh, our white uh, lemonade bottles and ginger beer bottles. So if you're into that kind of thing, our whites established in Camberwell in the 19th century, uh, by 1908, producing half of all the ginger beer and lemonades from England, taken over by Whitbread in 1969 and not quite as big as it was back then. Uh, as well as sort of crisp packets that came out. It's quite funny. It does show that plastic doesn't disappear. Uh, I think this dates from about 1975. Um, slim Discs giveaway on it, um, including, I think this one was uh, the Glitter Band, cheese and onion flavour, uh, obviously. We also um, put a new um, path in to All Saints Church. Um, this actually crosses part of the uh, moat. And in putting this in, we actually found uh, an older bridge, not that old, but it's known that it's been a bridge between the palace and All Saints for a very, very long time. Um, going back again to 1647, that parliamentary survey, it, it records a moat encompassing all the four sighted premises over which two foot bridges on the south side and a horse cart bridge on the west part thereof. So we think this is one of the foot bridges. Uh, 1900, um, Ferre, who wrote um, kind of the main text on Fulham really, he records two bridges with a main drive, which comes off Bishop's Avenue, and a drawbridge, which is this one here, or certainly there was a drawbridge here. This one is much later, um, dating between 1900 and 1924, uh, when the moat was backfilled. Um, so this may have gone in because uh, a more sort of sturdy iron bridge was required, um, possibly for the sort of um, kind of uh, sort of events that took place. We had a few, um, Bishop of London, Wellington, Ingram had a few kind of carnivals, as it were, in what's now the allotments. Perhaps uh, a new bridge was required to get the numbers of people that were visiting across the site. We also had some re really interesting finds within the building itself as we were redoing uh, to create our new museum and some new office space upstairs. We found this rather lovely 17th century toy plate underneath the floorboards, uh, which has had four holes punched into it, possibly uh, to be used as um, a set of scales, toy scales. And I had personally had a lot of fun in the roof space. So we know um, that originally the palace, and certainly in 1647, had rooms in the roof and that they were being used. Um, as it records, a great room with a chamber by it, a chamber with two studies and three little rooms by it over the lodges and wash houses on the west part of the court. So this is in the uh, above the Tudor arch, right up in the roof. Um, and we've got these lovely walls. They're still there. Um, I was amazed when I came across them. Um, constructed from staves with these. We've got door, which you can see in between them there, uh, the main uh, timbers there. Uh, these are probably associated with the little rooms. Um, a lot of the timber uh, Tudor roof was still up. Um, still extant on this side. The, the current roof is later, but they left bits of the roof up there. Obviously, too much to, uh, effort to bring down, and you can still see lovely elements of the Tudor, the Tudor carpentry work up there. Everything's more mortised and tenoned like this. Lovely mortised and tenon joints, no nails or just uh, wooden dowels. And you can really see there the kind of principal rafters, wind braces, and purlins. Um, so, really, quite amazing space to get into. Um, and I was, I felt quite privileged to be up there, to be quite honest, it was, it was really intriguing. 
Um, and they're very similar again to, to the construction of the Great Hall roof, which is obviously much wider and double purling. But again, those pin braces, all the construction is the same, which again, with that 1493 to 1495 date from the um, dendrochronology, definitely suggests the Tudor, Tudor courtyard is all very contemporary, built within a very short space of time. We've got a few carpenters' marks as well. These are really interesting. You can see two lines there. Um, and the kind of inverted V, uh, essentially kind of almost like a flat pack system so the carpenters knew which timbers joined together when they were building it. Uh, but perhaps one of the most intriguing things that we came across was in this room, which is in the second floor of the Tudor courtyard. Again, previously been an office, um, was being uh, uh, refurbished. Um, again, still an office now, but you can see rather a plain looking wall. Uh, but when we took off the um, plasterboard you can see a 19th century wall behind it with those lines on it and then behind that a much much earlier wall which is all hand painted uh, and there with the plasterboard removed you can see this rather fantastic hand painted work uh, and this was really quite confusing I'd never seen anything like this before and we had to get the experts in fairly sharpish to be quite honest because we didn't really know what we were looking at so when you look quite closely at it you can see the wall itself is very similar to the ones in the attic it's a, a daub um, but it's been painted over in these rather striking colours that sort of are stripy and they look slightly kind of um, almost floral, with sort of like, a, I don't know, it's like bamboo or something like that. So we got the, uh, the paint expert in, Catherine Hassel, she took some samples and she told us again, yes, the wall is made from plaster and timber, just like in the loft. Plaster again, made with lime grit, there's hair and straw present, and initially it seems to have been unpainted, so the paint wasn't original. Uh, lime wash was then added to the door, um, but this didn't go over the timber, so it's been plain, painted plain white. Later on, another lime wash added, <coughs> which did go over the timbers. That provided the paste base for the paintwork with a total of eight colours used in the scheme. Orange going on very last. Uh, it's an aqueous chalk-based uh, paint mixed with glue or gum. It's probably late 16th, early 17th century. I'm actually thinking more like mid 17th century now. Unusual that it's got no political content and heraldic symbols, but then we have to remember that we've only got one of the walls out of <coughs> what probably were originally four. So conserving it was interesting. I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, it had to be treated with this material called tylose, which is like a cellulose-based glue, uh, stop the paint from flaking. Timber had to be dealt with differently with a, an acrylic dispersion glue. We had a few slip panels we needed putting back. Um, they had to be injected with a grout. Um, designed specifically lime and daub, so it's one set, but essentially we managed to preserve the wall, um, restore it, and unfortunately it is now in an office, uh, but we put a, a new plasterboard over the top, but with windows in it, you can see it. So the idea originally was, hopefully with something like um, open house, people would be able to come and see it, but with the pandemic that's occurred, um, unfortunately that hasn't been able to take place yet, but a really interesting wall. And probably the most comparable one we could find is the Silk Merchant's House in uh, Marlborough. And this was uh, built by Thomas Bailey in 1653. And interestingly, uh, I personally think the paintwork was commissioned by uh, Colonel Edmund Harvey at Fulham Palace. He took over the palace when um, Bishop Juxon was kicked out um, during the Civil War. Uh, he was a parliamentarian, but he was also a silk merchant. So quite comparable, really, to what we're seeing in Marlborough. So again, part of uh, the, the restoration project wasn't just about the building and the archaeology, but also about the gardens. But again, to restore those uh, specimens that Bishop Compton um, grew here, some of them have quite deep roots. And again, we had to undertake archaeological excavation to provide planting beds. So we dug two trenches. Um, uh, this was one of the first ones. Uh, um, and this is the, the one to the south. This is between the wall garden and All Saints Church. Again, we got in uh, Brownies Guides, Beavers, Cubs and Scouts, as well as my young archaeologist club again, as well as school visits from the Motor School and Jack Tizard. Um, so again, another opportunity to do what we've been doing before with people getting involved with the excavation and, and, um, and enjoying learning how to excavate, how to record, how to bag and process finds as well. So unfortunately, uh, the northern of the two trenches uh, didn't quite go to plan. We discovered asbestos in there, so we had to call a stop to that. That appears to have been dumped in the 1970s. 
it looks like the council dug a hole, um, filled it with rubble, um, and then dumped all the leaf sweepings from Fulham on it as a drainage system. And of course, back then, asbestos wasn't illegal like it is now. Uh, and asbestos present, we just had to abandon the trench. And rather shockingly, we now have an area of contaminated waste on what is a scheduled ancient monument. Um, so that put pay to that trench. But things, you know, you can see there are lots of crisp packets again. So I've got pretty firm dating, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> uh, they've all got sell by dates on them. So I know when that rubble went into the ground, really. Uh, but we had a bit more fun in Trench 4 anyway. So we got this uh, path you can see on the left-hand side there. That aligns with the wall gardens. Got to be after 1764. Uh, not very well built, but, but uh, you know, very much so present. And we can see a path just outside the wall gardens here on this, this uh, map of the 1950s. So we know, we know that's uh, probably our last bit of archaeology there. Nice finds as well. Uh, 1897 coin of Queen Victoria. It's Hold it, it might have been one as a medal or something like that. Planting beds again, all rather fitting for the Compton dig, uh, aligning with the wall garden. Um, fine suggested there, 19th century in date. Uh, and interesting that these sort of globules of clay in the fields, which I think they might have been used for water retention, or they, I did chat to the garden as well, so they didn't think it would have been particularly effective, but they've got an interesting to see gardening techniques of the 19th century there. Uh, nice clay tobacco pipes again. That's got a City of London coat of arms on it again, probably early 19th century in date. And then things started to get rather more interesting um, as we got lower down in the trench. So you can just see turning up here a rather interesting sort of grey kind of curvilinear feature coming in just here. Uh, we've got a lot of um, uh, burnt flint. So when we associate that, we generally think of it as a pot boiler. So the prehistoric period, the pots weren't very good. So to heat water, they generally filled them with water, heated the uh, flint up through in the water to heat it. Uh, but again, really nice struck flint again there. Um, lots and lots of um, struck flint off the site. It's one of the largest assemblages of uh, work flint in the London region. It's very obviously a very important site in the late Neolithic to early Neolithic transition. Nice Roman ditch, just on the edge of the trench, not very, just not very deep, but again, got this rather nice Roman brooch out of it as well. So that's all fitting with our Roman history. And then again, you can see this curvilinear ditch turning up just here. So it's a big sort of discussion about what this might be. Um, prehistoric can be quite difficult to interpret at times, but from what we can say from what we found here, we didn't expose all of this ditch, this curvilinear ditch, but there was no terminal and no entrance, We've got no post holes with it, not a lot of material. So that suggests it's not a roundhouse. So you haven't got people living there. So it's what we call a drip gully, which goes around a kind of, prehistoric uh, roundhouse. Too small to be an enclosure uh, for an animal pen or something like that, certainly not enough animal bone either. So we therefore think it's probably a small Bronze Age barrow. Now there's a quite a concept with barrows that they always have inhumations in them. This isn't actually true, um, not all of them do. Um, so no inhumation. It could be a cenotaph barrow, which may be erected with no bodies available to be interred in it. It's obviously drowned or something. Uh, but barrows aren't just graves, they were monuments, they provide a visual impact. Um, so if you can imagine um, coming up the River Thames, seeing a barrow on the edge of the Thames, you know uh, somebody's there and occupying the land. They're often on the centre or on the periphery of family holdings uh, and they represent ter territorial compartmentalisation, so the defining rights over the specific resource areas. So it would make sense uh, to have a low barrow or something like that right on the edge of the Thames, just to say, you know, this is our land, this is where we live. Um, is a, an earlier example I excavated in 2004 in Castle Kent, you can see this is a quite large one. But again, really similar. Uh, this was again, another, another late Bronze Age low barrow, um, just running around there. And this is um, Winterbourne Stoke. And you can see how variable they are. You know, you've got some that are completely almost flat, Kind of saucer like some which have got mounded middle some which are kind of uh, a bit more prominent so they are quite variable but um essentially you can imagine something like this being along the edge of the thames so that it's a visible uh, a visible sort of upstanding uh, mound within the landscape as it were and going back to my original point perhaps one of the most exciting things that was found in the early 2000s on the north lawn so just the north palace which was rather nice pitch tile half. So you can see the tiles all here surrounded by ragstone and the date from this material seems to be the mid 1100s. So this at the moment is our earliest evidence 
of a building on the site. And this is probably the half to the first great hall, which would have been Saxo-Norman in date. Um, you can see that 13th century shift. So when that building was knocked down, everything moves slightly further south. Uh, this is our 13th century chapel underneath what's now the cafe area and onto the main lawn. You can see it's rather nicely in the summer when the, uh, uh, it gets rather hot, uh, we get parch marks. You can see the outline of the chapel. And this was the state wing that was pulled down in 1714. You can see the rather nice um, guard robe there. Uh, this is an earlier wall belonging to that Saxo-Norman um, Great Hall, but they've reused it and created what was the state wing. I think probably built in the um, early 1500s, not contemporary with the Tudor courtyard, because uh, it wasn't quite as well built and again needed pulling down. There's a lovely wall garden, so lots of um, restoration going on here. That's the, um, the Tudor entrance to it, which again, Bishop Fitzjames, so early 1500s. And that brings me to the end of the lecture. Uh, thank you very much. That's amazing. Thank you very much indeed. What a, a fascinating miscellany and uh, a range of dates and uh, above ground and below ground archaeology. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions if you're happy to answer. Absolutely. Any. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if I can answer them. <laughs> I'll ask people to either unmute themselves and just speak if you've got a question for Alexis or uh, write it, your question in the chat window if you prefer which is a button roughly in the middle at the bottom of the screen do whichever of those so anyone got any questions for Alexis um, Alexis um, thank you for a really interesting uh, uh, lecture um, I was at um, Ricelip we've got um, I don't know if you know about it the Manor Farm um, manor house um, and it's quite an early brick build um, but um, Fulham Palace um, I understand from Pevsner is earlier um, and um, I don't know how much um, information there has been about uh, the Fulham Palace um, um, carpentry work um, at um, the manor house Ryslip it was done by um, the same carpenters that it seems very likely that the same carpenters as um, King's College Cambridge who used advanced um, carpentry techniques um, they used the same similar carpentry techniques that's how we think um, that it was the King's College carpenters but um, is there um, is there any evidence of advanced carpentry techniques at uh, Fulham well, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I've had, um, oh, he came down. So I've had, uh, we had an expert in, so we've had the dendro done. So we know that 1493 to 1495 date. Um, and there's a certain tick list that he's got, which is really interesting as to a lot of the work that he's done has been in Surrey. Kind of, uh, Andy Moyer's his name. Um, and he was going around it, sort of looking at all, and he's got almost like a list of saying, yeah, that kind of fits in with that date, that works with that date. They're not doing that till a little bit later on. You know, um, so, I mean, it, it's a fascinating thing because obviously it's the Bishop of London, he's going to have have had yeah. access to almost like the King's Carpenters, as it well, should he have wanted them. And um, it's been really interesting to look at, to, to, to wonder whether this is new or whether things change rapidly or, or sort of the levels of carpentry. Also, the brickwork. Because I mean, this brickwork is quite new. It's coming in really from a kind of Flemish influence. So I often wonder: were the people that first built the palace were they Dutch? You know, it's quite possible that they were. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the weird things about the palace is we we've got dendro from certain bits of it, like our gates, which are Baltic oak, and uh, bits of oak in our great hall. But actually, most of the palace is made from elm, which they have serious problems getting dates from. And there were the historic England working very hard to see if they could do this. It's not. It's not as good as oak, essentially, for, for dating that tree ring analysis. Um, yeah. And but, but Fulham was heavily elmed, and it is mentioned in, in numerous uh, kind of articles about you know the bishops in trouble for chopping his elms down, blah blah blah. So he's probably using his own timber, um, which would have been readily available within his manor. But yeah. um, who built it? And and there almost certainly would have been the kind of master craftsmen of the time, as it were. 
Uh, but again, I'd have to like defer my to the, to the greater knowledge of someone like Andy Moyer to, to tell you about the techniques and whether they were cutting edge. We certainly had someone from um, again from historic royal palaces coming in, and they were very satisfied with the data. Yeah, that works. That, that, that's that's yeah. pretty good. So yeah. it's really interesting. I've got really into timber and brickwork. <laughs> yeah, it is. Since, yeah, yeah. Yeah, since Thanks. looking at it. Thank you. That's all right. My pleasure. Whilst other people are thinking, can I ask what happens to the site where the asbestos was found? Do you pay to have it properly removed or is that an area you can never again excavate? To remove it would cost a lot of money. Um, we don't know how far it expands. So essentially we removed what was exposed, backfilled it, sealed it. So generally with asbestos, if you don't disturb it um, and it's it's secure, that's okay, but if you're going to disturb it and you have to remove it, and that's going to cost a lot of money. So um, at the moment, it's just it's just really frustrating for the gardeners because a head gardener wanted to put a new bed in there, um, particularly with tamarix, which is uh, was brought over interestingly by another bishop, Bishop Grindle from uh, kind of um, from fr from Strasbourg. So it's kind of French tamarix, one of the first places it's grown not the first place it's grown in England. So the tamarisk is very important to Fulham Palace, but the bed that she'd set aside for that was unfortunately a no-go. So at the moment, it's just grassed over. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else with a question for Alexis? Well, I, I've, I've got a comment. Um, I, I, I was fascinated by the painted walls. Uh, because I, I, I know the Merchant's House in Marlborough well, um, and I, but I haven't actually seen those stripes elsewhere. And I'm, I'm wondering how common they are. Uh, they're sort of like candy stripes almost, aren't they? Yeah. So the theory is that we've got at the moment is that both um, the, the, the silk merchant at Marlborough and perhaps Colonel Edmund Harvey are representing their silks through these paintings. Oh. So that's one. Of the, it's really funny because I, I emailed uh, the Merchant's House uh, saying, you know, like, you know, because on the website says, you know, this is unique. There's nothing, you know. Um, and I was like, well, we, we've got this. We think they're really similar. And the email I got back was from someone saying, and it said, Hi Alexis, I haven't heard from you for a while. It was one of my volunteers from 2014. <laughs> <laughs> so she works there now. <laughs> But yeah, well, I quite like, there's a few weird things we've got coming up. Um, I quite like to connect with them on that level uh, because I think they're very similar. And actually, Colonel Edmund Harvey was uh, a member of parliament called Great Bedwin, which is just down the road from oh, Marlborough. Yeah. So I'm almost certain these two guys knew each other. They probably had very, very similar interests, uh, certainly in terms of what they were doing. And he just, honestly, the Civil War period is just so bizarre. Uh, with the interweaving um, people that we're yeah. seeing cropping up time and time again. Um, and it, it's just really weird. But that wall was a, a real surprise um, and really fascinating. It's just so frustrating that it's in a place that the general public can't see it. Yeah. But it, 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 it does suggest that it, it, it was a bit of a fashion in certain circles. I think so, yeah. I'd say so. I mean, it's, it's a way of... Of, uh, of really kind of showing off, isn't it? Yeah. And um, they're quite gaudy and mm. quite, um, quite brash, yes. as it were. Um, so, I mean, at, at the time, I mean, Colonel Harvey seems to have done quite well out of the Civil War, to be quite honest. It all went horribly wrong at the end, you know, when he, the, the palace was taken back and mm. he was a regicide. So uh, he didn't actually sign the warrant, but he ended up imprisoned in Pendennis Castle, um, where he died, his family lost everything. So, um, it, it really intriguing, but at the time, he's certainly moving in uh, very close circles with Cromwell and and and, and you know um, uh, John Ireton, who's the brother of, of Henry Ireton. So it's really and he, you know <laughs> he's, he's obviously doing okay for a while, and um, he's being quite flashy with what, what he's got. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Melanie. It's a lecture in itself that one. <laughs> mm, I'm sure. Does anyone else want to add anything or ask a question? Yes. Yes, please yes. do. Yes, thank you. I'm I'm Jenny Yule. Um, 
May I ask a question about the, the finds of the um, bird bones that were that um, materialized in, in, the, in the kitchen or the slaughterhouse or whatever it was at the time? Um, it was a very interesting collection of birds. And now what about peacocks or were they considered rather too exotic? to be eaten by um, the, the, the general public. Was there something about peacocks that were, was not allowed to be eaten or were they just not available at the time? What happened to peacocks? Well, you got peacock bone as well. So they were still eating peacocks. Oh, oh you did <laughs> yeah, peacock we did. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, I, didn't, I just didn't, I didn't have a photo of one, that was all. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is the thing. Um, I mean, it was really weird with the, the sort of the small birds, like the small thrushes, you really do start to think about the kind of display that must have been involved in some of these um, these meals. And actually the diet of the palace is one of the main things we've really, really looked at, because we've got the serving vessels, we've got the food. So don't forget, there's just two tiny little slots there that we put in across a massive ditch. Um, and, and the amount we got from it was crazy. So you really get an insight into what they're eating. And it, even going back, we've got things like, I think I've got a, an eel that was some ridiculous size and a pike that was over a metre long and all kinds of weird and wonderful things that were coming out of these very high status diets. But um, yeah, I think the peacock obviously fans, but they were eating it. And then the turkey appears and that fans too. But at some point, obviously it has been consumed. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all really high status. I mean, we got... Um, Famously, Elizabeth I visited on several occasions, so they would have been looking after her. And of course, she had a famously had a salt cellar stolen at Fulham Palace um, during one of her visits as well, which is something you like to play up on quite a lot as well. They did capture the two thieves, and we don't know, although we don't know what happened to them. So entertainment and, and a large household that it would have been as well uh, for the bishop suggests that you know all kinds of weird and wonderful. Uh, delicacies were being served at the dinner table. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, anyone else with any cop comment or question? Last chance? <laughs> okay, well. well I, I was just, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember, we, we had a society visit to Fulham Palace, we, which was a, a fascinating day. Um, and I, I'm just tr trying to remember how they brought things into the palace. That there's a, it's more of a stream than a river, I think, sort of running alongside, isn't, isn't it? Um, and then was there an entrance to the moat to bring things round to the- um, There the were bridges across the moat. And there's uh, the bishops, the famously the bishop's steps as well. So um, there would have been, um, obviously the, the moat was cleaned out, so they'd have to drain it and then refill it at high tide. Oh. But obviously the main source of delivery to the palace is going to be via the Rib Thames. Mm. Uh, the bishop had a barge, it's the easiest way to get up and down. Um, so the river is, is and it, throughout history, the site is really all about the river and that crossing point between Fulham and Putney. Yeah. So everything, I mean, as well as that, I mean, the, the bishop had owned the fishing rights to the river itself, of which he leased out to fishermen, but they had to give him mm. X amount of catch or they had to give him a good price mm. on this and that. So he's he's got it all at his fingertips, really, <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> but yeah, the, yes, the, the I, river is so I, 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 I was, um, I think, it, even knowing the bishops of yore, I, I was quite surprised at the lack of humility of some of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're quite variable in character. Um, and some you end up quite liking and some you're kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about him. You know? <laughs> uh -huh. you, in connection with that, Alexis, you mentioned something being described as a key near where you did your first trip yeah. looking for the dovecot. Does that mean there was a sort of inlet where boats could be pulled up off Quite the possibly, Thames? and it may be down yeah. near where the ferry steps is now, um, just on the Thames. So um, that, that's a distinct possibility. Yeah. Yes. Um, but you haven't found any timber work that would indicate no, any that, that's actually outside. or staging, yes. It's actually outside the, uh, the 
palace boundary as well. Mm. But, um, oh. Yeah, there's certainly been some very interesting work done uh, not long ago, which has given me a, a better insight into the moat. Um, I've got a lecture on that coming up. So. Uh, right, right. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that sounds Won't give too much away. <laughs> yes, yes, well, yes, but, yes, that's very tempting. We, but perhaps I'd like to invite you back sometime. Uh, yeah, that, sure, that always, be, always. It's be fascinating. So, right. Sorry, I'm, I'm very happy to give way to others if, if there are some more questions. But I was wondering about the windows. You, you, you showed um, one window that was being, or the frame was being fully restored. Um, are, are a lot of the windows much later or? Yeah. Um, Tudor ones? We, it, it did suffer, um, certain bits of the palace suffered bomb damage in the war. Oh, yeah. uh, some windows were taken out during the war and don't ever seem to have reappeared um, and some windows were supposedly taken out and we've got some interesting things that happened when Bishop Jackson left uh, before uh, Harvey took over including a rather nice uh, screen which depicts the marriage of uh, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, which is now in a church in Stenning in Sussex. Mm. Um, and some interesting sort of trace work from that suggests that Bishop Johnson might have lifted a few things before he left. To be fair, like, you know, with the, the Puritan nature of, of things going on, he was probably trying to preserve... He was probably, probably quite sensible. Mm. Yeah, I think yes. so. But at the same time, Harvey doesn't seem... We've still got some, Lord, you know, Laudian elements around. So Harvey doesn't seem to have gone full on Puritan on a lot of it, but it probably wasn't worth the risk. So I think Jackson mm. had a few things away, some of which came back, maybe, but some of which are now ended up down in Stenning. But that's quite nice because I'm giving a lecture down there. It's the 500th anniversary of the screen. So um, I don't think we'll be getting that back. But like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing looking. I can't wait to see it. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Doreen, you've put your hand up. Yes, I, I'm just um, just concerned about the, the asbestos. Is it not up to the council to remove it? And if it's washing into the river, is, is there some poison maybe washing from the asbestos into the Thames? So asbestos is a fibre. Um, this is something that um, you get drilled in when you work in archaeology now. Um, uh, we all have to have asbestos awareness um, and generally speaking if it's undisturbed it's safe so it's not going to wash in because it's like a fiber uh, rather than a kind of it's not a liquid if you see what I mean so it's actually kind of mm. solid there's different types of asbestos some are much worse than others they're all bad um, but generally speaking say if you've got an asbestos tile in your in your on your roof or in your toilet or something like that and it's in everything believe you ask this business in everything from door handles to toilet seats to, to to fire doors to you name it it's everywhere if you don't touch it and you leave it alone it's all it, it, it's fine if you start smashing it or breaking it or you know messing around with it that's when it becomes a problem so the safest option for us was just to, to seal it and to leave it where it is but the council put it there, shouldn't they take it away? <laughs> that's, mm. <laughs> that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I, I will leave that to my CEO. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Doreen. Any, anyone else got anything for Alexis? Or any comment on what we've heard tonight? Right. Well, in, in that case, it just leaves me to, to thank you again, Alexis, for an absolutely fascinating talk. And I can see why it's your dream job, because it uh, covers just about every period from the Bronze Age to the 1970s. And it covers below ground and above ground and crawling around in roof spaces, a bit of a favourite of mine, actually, and uh, look, looking at uh, medieval timber work plaster work and uh, bronze bronze age monuments i mean is there any site in london that encompasses such a wide range of uh, different periods and uh, potential activities in a small area it's it, it's it sounds to me to be a brilliant brilliant place to be yeah it's great 
thanks so much for having so, me so uh, thank you it's that. been absolutely fascinating a real delight and uh, wish you well with everything you're doing at fulham palace and we look forward to the time when we can uh, have another visit there as a society and uh, see the restoration and what's been happening since we were last there so thanks very much indeed and, and good luck with everything Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank and very just much. to remind Bye. everybody, the next meeting is on the 21st of March when we're uh, being addressed by uh, Dorian uh, Gerhold on Old London Bridge and its houses circa 1209 to 1761. So that'll be another fascinating talk. So do join us then on the same Zoom link uh, in, in on the 21st of March. See you then. OK. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.